Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining California Department of Veterans Affairs for empowering women veterans with impactful resources and support. Before we, we begin, I would like to bring to your attention that this uh, wet workshop is being recorded, recorded, and as a disclaimer, you logging in is uh, your acceptance of being a part of this recording. Um, the great thing about this recording Recording that it's going to be available on our website and also our YouTube channel. So you can share and you can watch this um, with others um, that may benefit from the information. My name is Jennifer Rudquist, and I'm proud to say I'm a CalTAP training coordinator with the California Department of Veterans Affairs. Additionally, I'm an Air Force veteran myself, and my daughter is currently serving in the Air Force. With that being said, um, being a part of this workshop, sharing resources and support, in addition to being here with state and federal veterans women's division is an honor to me. And I want to follow up by saying thank you to each and every female service member, past, present, and future for raising your hand. Um, we make up the strong 17% of the United States defense against all that threaten our country. And that number grows every year with courageous women who put their service before self. So thank you very much. Let's get started. So I'm excited you joined today's presentation because it's packed with great information and resources that I know is going to make a huge impact on your lives. In addition to myself, um, Jana Adams, another CalTAP training coordinator, is here running the back end, adding resources and links to the chat function. And she's also going to be monitoring the Q&A uh, section of the webinar. That's where we ask that you put all of your questions in so we can... Um, give those to the subject matter experts, and so we can address all of those at the end of our presentation. So moving right along, let's go over our agenda. Our first presenter is Lourdes Tigliano. She is the executive director for Center for Women Veterans, Fed, the federal division. Um, she will be going our federal women veterans resources and support. Following Ms. Tigliano, we will have um, Calvet Women's Veterans Division Manager Adriana Griffin. She will present be presenting on state resources and support. And finally, we will have Calvet resources, um, and then we'll move on to those questions. So let's get started. We're going to start off with Lourdes. Are you there, Lourdes? Yes, I am. Hang on just a second. Let me see if I can get my slides uh, ready. All or right. shared. Yes. Hold. Tell me when you are able to see these. Hopefully. Share yes. screen. Thank you so much see for it? being here with us. Let's... Can you see it yet? Not quite oh. yet. Oh, it says um, we'll stop other people sharing. Hold yes. On. That's okay. Yes. Okay. Give me make sure this is the right one and all right perfect all right i'm going to turn off my camera and you can turn yours on you have the floor perfect um good morning everyone and apologies uh a little bit of a technical issue on my side um my name is lourdes tigla i'm the executive director for the center for women veterans i'm really really uh, excited to be here with all of you today and thank you for being here i'm here to just give you a little bit about um, what the center for women veterans is and what uh, some of the programs and services that VA has for women veterans uh, across the nation. So the Center for Women Veterans has been around since 1994. Our mission is to make sure that we advocate for equitable outcomes and access to VA benefits, services, and opportunities for women veterans, whether it's through education, outreach, and collaboration. Our aim and our goal is to make sure that women veterans are empowered to achieve their life goals through VA benefits and services. And of course, because we cannot do this without the community, without each and every one of you, we wanna make sure that we're highlighting that this is a collaboration and a partnership with our community stakeholders. VA cannot be the panacea for everything. And so each and every one of you is important to make sure to be a part of the solution. Um, what we, the, some of the work that we do is not only advising on policies and programs and legislations that relates to and impacts women veterans, but it's also to disseminate information particularly research and pol updated policies, and of course, supporting the Independent Advisory Committee on Women Veterans. So how do we do this? We do all of this, oops, hold on. We do all of this through number one, advocacy, advocating both internally and externally um, on VA and across the nation that, so that the 
contributions and the sacrifices that uh, women veterans have made is not forgotten, is not lost, is not overlooked, but also advocating for parity of uh, that recognition. The other work that we do, um, it's a big major part of the work um, that the center does is outreach. Outreach not only in our local area here, but in local areas across the nation. We have been going to various forums, town halls, conferences across the nation, making sure that we are connecting with women veterans and connecting them to the services and benefits that they've earned. Why is that important that we go out there into the communities? It's because we want to make sure that we are building trust. You can't build trust only through the screen. We have to make sure that we are building trust by meeting our women veterans where they are at. The other part is in policy. We're looking at various different policies that impact women veterans. Um, and that ranges from anything from childcare through uh, through making sure that they're getting gender specific care, through uh, the it, participation with the Violence Against Women um, working group, and various others um, that I'll touch on a little bit later. And then obviously, um, we can't do anything without data. And so research is extremely important. It's not only that we're conducting our own sociographic research, but also ensuring that women veterans are participating in research as well. Women veterans are extremely underrepresented in a lot of the research, or just women in general actually, are underrepresented in a lot of research across the nation. And so we can't learn about how we can better tailor interventions, therapies, et cetera, without having them participate in this research. So as we go through, as we talk about several different things and the, um, several other services that you'll hear from other colleagues and other organizations, please remember that all of these we're trying to make sure that these are evidence-based and data-driven, and that can't be done without um, your participation um, in this research. So how does CWB do um, the things that we do? What are our goals? Uh, I talked about just the broad, big buckets, um, what, we, what we're aiming for. So our goals is to make sure that we are increasing access, decreasing barriers, improving outcomes, and increasing enrollments and engagement, and of course, advocating for increased recognition and memorialization. How we do this, I talked a little bit about outreach, advocacy, the policy, and also future foundations, right? Like we, I mean, we as like, you know, people here, we won't be here forever. So making sure that we establish great foundations for the future so that the work continues and continues to evolve as we bring in new generations of women veterans into our ecosystems and in, into our society. So several priorities that have come up um, that we, I, my brain likes to work in big buckets. So I look at health wellness, and particularly under that, we're looking at homelessness, suicide prevention, MST and IPV, mental health, and then gender specific care. We're also looking at economic wellness, so economic empowerment for women veterans. The way that we look at it from the center is economic empowerment, number one, through what women veteran entrepreneurship. There's over $600 billion in contracting with the government, and we are supposed to do like between three and 5% um, that goes to women-owned businesses. And so that's a lot that's a lot of dollars that can go into women and women veterans if they are able to access um, those avenues. The other um, the other prong on economic empowerment is actually getting more women veterans in STEM. I look at STEM uh, careers and STEM fields as a great equalizer. And so also STEM careers tend to be more portable. If you're in the medical field, you can go to any state, any community and have a job. If you're in tech, you have the potential and possibility to be able to work remote. And so um, it's a great equalizer. And so getting more women veterans involved in STEM by taking advantage of, of some of the VA uh, scholarships and programs will allow them to have that, that higher wage um, earning opportunity if they uh, participate and choose to take advantage of those benefits. The other priority areas in transition wellness, particularly for service women and women veterans in transition, I'm looking at it also from a psychological readiness. So uh, I'll, I'll highlight very quickly the women's health transition training that is uh, specifically engaged. It's a specific um, module that allows transitioning service women and women veterans, if you've already gotten out, to actually learn like step-by-step -step in a modularized fashion how to engage, how to access various um, VA healthcare services. It, it goes in like stepwise fashion. And so it's really great. So you can always like go back to the training 
And uh, I was like, I only have uh, maybe a half an hour, an hour to listen to this or to watch this. You could always go back and learn more and like take it in chunks because it is, I think, about three to five hours, depending on how fast you go. And then um, increasing knowledge and awareness and education. So I talked a little bit about research earlier, but it's also about how do we reach, how do we connect to women veterans? So we have various diversified platforms. We leverage social media, newsletters, focus groups, forums, and conferences. And so the big aim is to make sure that, again, we are going to where women veterans at instead of making them come to us. The other part of our priority is creating areas um, where we can build trust and belonging. We're making sure that as we recognize women veterans' sacrifices and contributions, that we're also increasing women veterans' voices and bringing them to the table and making sure that the community that we are building is one that is of inclusion and making sure that we are creating environments where women feel like they be, that women veterans feel like they belong. In doing so, by recognizing their contributions in the same parity, by bringing them to the table where decisions are made, it also helps them to improve the outcomes for women veterans, um, not only enterprise-wide, but nationwide, because uh, you probably heard the, um, the saying, you know, nothing, uh, nothing about us without us. So making sure that we are doing this in a collaborative fashion. And finally, accountability, making sure that we are looking at everything from a data-centric standpoint and integrating that information across the enterprise as we look at various policies, programs, and, uh, and other uh, initiatives that impact women veterans. So just some of the things that we've done in the past, uh, just in the last year, We've been uh, participating and engaging with the Veterans Experience Office here at VA. And so we've been participating pretty heavily on the VX or the Veterans Experience Action Center. This is a one-stop shop where any woman veteran, even if you've never used VA at all, where you walk in or you dial in if it's a virtual one, um, and you can literally walk out potentially with, you know, your first check if it's in, if it's in person um, and having your first or several appointments for your healthcare um, as well as probably um, some of your appointments for your evaluations. And so we bring all of the services and, um, and, and the people to bear in one event to make sure that we are able to address any issue that is brought up by our women veterans when they come to us. And so we are super uh, proud that last year we were able to hold, number one, the very first Pacific Region VIAC that addresses um, the women veterans living um, in the various territories, as well as in um, in Hawaii. But also, we were able to do our very first nationwide um, Women Veterans VIAC in October 2023. That is uh, an extremely uh, important milestone because up to that point, VA has only been doing a state-by-state -state VIAC. And this was the first time that we've leveraged like the entire nation to make sure that we reach all of the women veterans that we can get across the nation. We've been using a lot of innovative tools that's available and have been developed to make sure that we are reaching, we call it tethered, but basically it's a woman veteran that's never used any of the VA services. And finally, um, the next Women Veterans VIAC um, is gonna be coming up um, later on this year. I'm gonna put a little bit of plug um, for anyone who's um, maybe traveling and they're traveling maybe in New York sometime in September, like maybe September 20. Um, we're actually hosting an event um, along with VEO. Um, uh, we're doing a VIAC um, for all veterans, but we're doing a special women veterans track during this time um, at Yankee Stadium. So if you're, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you're there in uh, New York sometime in September 20, um, come visit us at Yankee Stadium. So here's just several of the events um, that we've got. Obviously, that's today. Um, in Chicago, there, it's actually March 30. It's on Saturday, not rather than March 29. Um, there's a resource fair that's going to be happening um, in Chicago. It's in collaboration with not only the county, but also the state, and also with the um, VA medical centers that are there locally. And 29th, we have a survey launch. Of specifically, we are this survey is looking to glean insights on why women veterans aren't using um, or aren't applying for their benefits. I'm not going to go through every single one of these other um, events, but just suffice to say, we're quite, quite busy. 
Um, and so we're kind of everywhere. So when um, when we are getting close to any of the areas you, where you might be, where you're visiting, please come and join us. Here's just some of the other uh, commemoration events. May, um, we're working on something for Mother's Day. And then June, it's Women Veterans Day Recognition Month. Um, so obviously June 12th is pretty important with the uh, anniversary of the Armed Forces Integration. Uh, and so again, just we're, we are very busy. We're providing, trying to provide as many ways to connect with women veterans everywhere. Here's just some of the ways that you can engage. We've got the bystander intervention training. These are some of the resources that you can um, leverage and utilize. Not all of this is actually here at VA because we obviously partner everywhere with various organizations who are doing great things. Um, and so <clears throat> the bystander intervention training, this is a training that VA has provided that is created by VA specifically to empower those who are um, who are witness to um, any harassment or assault to empower them to know how to in, how to either a stop the cycle, how to interrupt, um, or how to report uh, how to report the incident. The Library of Congress's Veterans History Project is extremely important because there's over like a hundred thousand. Um, stories of veterans that are in the Veterans History Project and oh, less than 10,000 is actually about women veterans. And so the stories are extremely important to be told because those are the stories that other young women who are going to be listening, watching, learning, reading, um, and they serve as inspiration for who they can be in the future. Renaming facilities, we're super proud that we're working um, to with the community, so VA cannot rename any facility that is by an act of Congress. However, we do provide some of the data of of uh, the the rate at which um, facilities and um, and uh, clinics are are named after women veterans. Why is this important? This is part of that um, aspect of recognizing women veterans' recognition and contributions. Um, maybe in the chat, let um, how many. Uh, VA medical centers, do you think, are named after women veterans? You can just put out put out numbers. Three, okay. There's a little more than that. We've gotten <clears throat> we've gotten up to five, seventeen. No, we've gotten up to five. Um. And the, the thing that I'm, there's over 150 uh, medical centers around the nation. Only five are actually named after women, four are named after women veterans. Why is this significant? Because the first, between the first and second and the second and third, there's at least 12 to 15 years in between. And so um, between the first and second, I think it's like 12 or maybe 15 years. And then the second and third is I think over 30 years in between um, a facility being renamed the third, fourth, and fifth started in 2021. 2021, the first one got um, named 22 and then 23. The last one that was renamed was actually um, with Alaska, with Anchorage VA Medical Center um, being named after Colonel Mary Rasmussen. And so it just goes to show that when we're, what's changed, right? So we're, ele we're elevating um, some of these stark numbers of how women veterans um, aren't being recognized in the same fashion. Think about it like in the in the context of in the civilian sector, right? How many airports are named after women? And you'll probably see that it's very, very, very small. And it's certainly not because um, women have not contributed to aeronautics, but it is a part of like what we have to work on as a society to recognize the contributions of women um, with the same seriousness, parity and gravity. So the Women's Health Transition Training, this is the website. Um, so, you know, take a screenshot of this, make sure that you're able to get in there. You don't have to be a transitioning service member to, to access this. You can be a veteran that's been out 30 years um, and still be able to access this and learn how to use the uh, resources in order to connect with your healthcare here at VA. The Million Veterans Program, I was talking about research earlier, and this is um, a VA's uh, particular research program to provide, uh, to get more research for more tailored interventions and therapeutics um, for, vet for veterans as a whole. 
the Women Veterans Survey, I talked a little bit about it already earlier. So I just encourage folks to participate, please. Um, here are some of the resources. Take a screenshot, take a clip. Um, these are just the ways that if you need a quick, like, I don't know where to get X, Y, Z, here are the ways to find them and to get you know, important information. This is the team. This is the dream team that we have. So um, we are pretty excited about um, who we have on our team, and they are the ones who are going to be um, responding to you when you have a question, when you reach out to us through this and you can reach us at 00w at va.gov. Um, you can also reach us by phone or um, reach out to us through social media. And uh, any questions? Thank you so much, Lourdes. Those were really great slides. We actually um, would love to have, um, do you have a PDF of that slide deck? Um, would you be able to get that to us so we can share that with everyone? Yeah, absolutely. You can do that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Those are great. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for what you do for uh, women veterans um, all over the world, honestly. Um, so we really appreciate you being here. Um, thank you for the resources and the support that you do every single day all over the United States. <laughs> thank you. Right. Thank you for having me. Oh. All right. Um, with that, we're going to hand the floor. I'm going to start sharing my screen once again, and we're going to hand the floor over to Adriana Griffin. She is our uh, division manager for women's division here at CalVet. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you, Lourdes. I, I love getting information from the Center for Women Veterans. They are definitely one of the main resources that we use at CalVet Women Veterans Division. Um, so yes, my name is um, Adriana Griffin. I am retired Air Force and um, I have been at CalVet just a little over a year. So um, loving the job, came here to advocate for women veterans and um, every day is just living the passion. <laughs> Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so what we do at CalVet Women Veterans Affairs is I like to start off by bragging a bit that uh, my understanding as of about uh, within the last year, California seems to be the one that most reflects um, the structure that the federal VA has in that we have an independent women veterans division with a deputy secretary um, appointee that's written into the military code. And we also have a minority and underrepresented veterans division. And uh, from what my understanding is, is not many other states, if any, have that. So I am very proud that California is not only mirroring what I believe the VA, federal VA is doing at a first class level, um, but that we have the opportunity for that representation at that level for the state of California. And what we do very similar at the state level is provide that information, that advocacy, that representation of women veterans um, and support for our California women veterans. Uh, here on this slide, you'll see a small flyer that is our current campaign for our women veterans survey. And uh, the button is, I think is, that's the logo that's on the button that once you uh, complete your survey, you can get one of those buttons. All right, next slide, please. So the demographics of women veterans in California, uh, we make up about 10% of veterans. That would put us at about 160,000. We're right under 160,000 women veterans and 32,000 women are still in uniform serving in the state of California. Our numbers, and we were discussing this a little bit earlier, they are um, have prep up to about 20%. While I was serving, they always stayed at an average when you calculated your officers and you enlisted right between 15, 17% average. Nationwide, we make up 10% of all veterans. Like I said, at the upper uh, teens of active duty, we have a higher percentage rate with National Guard and Reserves. And women veterans are exiting the military, separating whether because we've served our uh, in career time and are retiring or they are separating. And so they are making the pro uh, rata 
grow, fastest growing cohort of veterans. And the unique, the uniqueness of women veterans is that they are coming out and they are have either completed advanced education or want to complete their advanced education. They are looking for employment that will serve them and, and bring them in to commensurate to the level of experience and education that they have to the fullest potential of their talents and skills, but also might be in the process of barely starting a family. And that family uh, desire may look, it looks very different than what it used to 20, 10, 20, 30 years ago, where they have an equal partner in how they're going to approach these three things that they want to get done and they will get done. So that's what's making us very unique as women veterans coming out of the military in today's environment. Next slide, please. Some of the health challenges that women uh, tend to have, there are uh, a bit either higher rated or completely unique to the uh, biological makeup of uh, us being women. And so we do have some uh, reproduction, reproductive health issues. And as Lourdes mentioned, there is research that is being done to be able to uh, reconcile what the VA is providing uh, to women in women veterans health, in women's health overall. And um, I know that reproductive health is one of their main, main issues that they research. And then mental health challenges and how they differ, how a uh, PTSD might look in a woman veteran versus not, you know, a woman veteran and different ways to approach how you uh, question or how they evaluate uh, different mental health uh, issues or diagnoses among women. Uh, give me one second. We're going to see what's going on here. I think we have a little bit of technical issues, but no worries. I saw the slide stop, so I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. We're here. Jana's probably giving me a bill. Uh, there we go. Um, we're back up. <laughs> okay. And did everything come through on that this last slide? Uh, yes, we did. Oh. You did. Yes. Perfect. Okay, then we can uh, move on to the next slide. Thank you. Some of the unique challenges while we were in service that we didn't always share or, or discuss and that we are trying to meet our women veterans where they're at and bring those to light as well. Uh, the physical demands, some of us, they, you know, the size that we wore of shoes or uniform was possibly so small that we had to wear larger sizes. We had to accommodate and that may have impacted us for the long term. Some of the uh, exposures we may have had and all of the uh, studies that have been put out there regarding every time you PCS, every time you deploy the vulnerability period that there is for being a victim of sexual harassment or sexual assault and later on, you know, being a victim of military uh, sexual trauma. So the different schedules could also affect your vulnerability levels. Um, it also just wears on you because something that people don't take to, that don't consider is that every time you PCS and you're doing your house hunting and, and I've been in a situation where I was running out of house hunting, there were no homes on the market. There were no homes available on base. Those are temporary periods of housing instability and how that affects you and how it affects you moving into the next home, how it affects you on your next PCS. The same thing with deployment. Coming back as a mother, it was interesting because um, I remember coming back from deployment and everything's ready to eat on deployment, right? You go into the tent and there's fruit and salads and everything's just made to order and you go home. I got home from deployment and I'm just moving along with my evening and my children are looking at me. It's about 8 p.m. And I'm like, can I help you? And they're like, are we going to get dinner? And I was like, oh, OK, yeah, I forgot that was on me again. Right. So um, so just those kind of experiences that we all have uh, are, are different, unique lived experiences as a result of some of these schedules and and changes, constant changes. 
um, circadian rhythms if you were an aviator and traveled to different countries and had to come back or different time zones and had to come back and as your uh, mental and physical readjusted to those time zones. Uh, gender norms and attitudes is, is a significant one. As Lourdes mentioned, there is a mindset um, that is changing and a mindset that needs to continue to change to get to the point where these gender norms of possibly being assigned um, to a unit that either never had females or has not had a lot of females to the point where even in my time, in the last 10 years, uh, there were no female restrooms available in certain EOD units, for example. Having to create a stall just for the female and having to have to have a sign out that says, no one can enter, so now you know my restroom routine. Um, and so, uh, or, hey, you're the only female in the shop and I thought you were going to do, you know, this place was going to get spruced up and cleaned and decorated every holiday. I've been on the receiving end of that. Those are my lived experiences, um, my unique experience with my 26 years in the military. So I know that all of my sisters have their stories to tell. And it's important that we tell them and we share them and that we share them with our brothers and our allies because a lot of times when I've shared my stories, they will just look at me in awe and say, I had no idea that you were going through that at, or that you were experiencing that um, every day, those little microaggressions or those little micro experiences that were adding up. That goes right into that military culture and attitudes. For the most part, the military has been male centric. And a lot of times people forget that women have been serving since the very first conflict. Women have absolutely been a part of the makeup and fabric of every conflict leading up to, you know, every every social issue, every political issue. And so, but as a minority group, as the numbers built up and the reasons that they had why we weren't in the military or weren't giving the full benefits um, to where we are now. So we're still, we are still repairing that dash in between those times and still trying to go back and correct some errors that were made in, in recognition of women who contributed. So those contributions that just were not highlighted or were not recognized at all. And so I think we're doing a great job about going back and getting those things corrected. And if there's a story that you've been told by your grandmother or your aunt or your mother whoever it may be, someone in your life, and there's a story that you think needs to be told and hasn't yet been told. These organizations, such as the Calvet Women Veterans Division, the Center for Women Veterans um, at the federal level, the Women Veterans Memorial in DC, we're all there to capture those stories. And then military transition, we all know, and as I spoke earlier, the current woman veteran being the largest cohort exiting the service, um, you have your typical transitionary hiccups and bumps along the road. And sometimes we're hearing of people that all of a sudden their time is up and they have no plans, no housing, no, no employment, no education plans whatsoever. Um, and with the uniqueness of, as I mentioned before, possibly she's about to separate and she's also about to have a child or has just recently had a child and so that's where the unique needs of women veterans mainly. Um, and we've already talked about recognition. So next slide, please. So how do we support women veterans? And this is where I call upon us, each other. We have to do it for each other, just like bystander training. Um, we have to be able to speak up for each other and also share with an ally and know that there are plenty of allies out there and you share this kind of information. So if any of my allies are in the audience, um, you don't have to be a woman veteran to, to do these things. First, never assume that she's the spouse. Uh, in the events and in our world, being a woman veteran, I enter uh, a, an event or a venue, assuming that if I'm gonna assume the male or the man is a veteran, I'm going to assume the woman is a veteran. And so that goes to the second point. If you are at a veteran event, you always assume she's a veteran. 
I uh, have an example with the um, Women Veterans Health Fair, for example, and we were manning booths where we were providing resources, different resources were there. And the individual on the table next to me would ask the ladies as they were coming across the table. And he was asking them, are you a veteran? Did you serve? And when we had a break, I leaned over and I said, we're at a women veterans health fair event. Um, if you don't mind, you know, I'd like to give us feedback. Don't ask them if they served or if they're a veteran. Talk to them like they're a veteran until they correct you because I don't see many other reasons. There's a few, but I don't see a whole bunch of reasons why she would be here and not be a veteran. Um, but, and if she's not because she's there accompanying her veteran friend, she will let you know, oh, I didn't serve. And, but she's there supporting a veteran. So those are kind of my top two. Um, we also have noticed that women veterans um, not do not all connect with the term veteran. I have met Korea era, Vietnam era. Um, it doesn't even matter, Gulf War era. I had I just met a woman yesterday. Well, I only served two years. I'm not really a veteran. And we always say, don't say only, don't say just. And so it seems to be that they're more comfortable when you ask, did you serve? And then you go from there. And then do you have your VA benefits? And that's how we proceed. So even amongst each other, if you know of any women veterans who just don't identify it, just remember, acknowledge, because she will let you know if she served. She just may not identify as a veteran. And then we work from there to get her the benefits that she earned as a veteran. And so education and understanding, as always, always, please don't rely on me to teach you everything about women veterans, because I can only speak on my lived experience and my interaction, what I'm learning from my sisters out there and from some of my brothers in uniform. Um, so take the time to read up uh, on these historical accountings. There's, there's history books that have always included the stories of women serving. And now we have more information that's coming out. We have um, the 6888. We have, I think they're doing something on the Hello Girls. And I like to throw things out there. And if you don't know what they are, because I want you to go look it up and I want you to go find out about it. And then we have our uh, available resources. So we do on our website, uh, we have the Calvet Women Veterans Affairs website, and there is a resource link there. And we do provide California resources. Um, there are some nonprofit organizations that are specifically designed to assist women veterans. There are state level organizations and we have the federal organizations as well. And we also have the link to those trainings that are provided at the Center for Women Veterans um, website as well. And then once again, I give all the kudos in the world. I love that the state of California finds it important and a priority to make sure that we have that representation that you see me as a woman veteran advocating for women veteran, and they are all over the place. Women continue to serve by serving our veteran community, and I'm appreciative for everyone that's out there doing the work. Next slide. So what we do is we, we try to meet the woman veteran where she at, where she is at in California, and we do also deliver our information in a diverse set of platforms, one-on-one, uh, -on -one in-person social events. Right now we are conducting our survey. I'll speak a little bit more on that. We're about to close that survey up. And, but we are getting out there. We do women veteran specific events, but we also um, bring through, you know, at normal veteran events. Um, and what we do is we collect data, we collect the information. Where are you? What do you need? What can California do to better improve your access to service, you know? And so uh, once we do that, we develop specific trainings and webinars towards women veterans. Um, we do reach out, we do our outreach, as I said, through a diverse uh, set of platforms. We have our women veterans roster and our newsletter. And, and we, um, this also is all a part of building community. You know, just as Moses mentioned on the federal level, at the state level, our work is to build that community. And I met a young, young 
woman veteran yesterday who had the experience of being questioned um, where she was parking on a military base because although she has separated from the military and is now a veteran, her spouse is still active duty. And she was questioned coming out of her own vehicle, mind you, very, very pregnant. She said she just got completely caught off guard. And those of us in the room were like, you do not have to put up with that. You know, you're being threatened that they're gonna call security forces. I said, no, I would have I would have reversed that situation and said, let me get your name you know, and I need to make sure that this gets reported as well. And just, you know, just that level, when we saw like a community building that was like wrapping around her immediately and, and just saying, hey, you have a right to do this and you should, you could do this and you could do that. And you could tell that she felt very supported and very uplifted because up until that moment, she was feeling misunderstood. And, um, so we do hope to build that community in state of California and to continue to contribute to that larger community, you know, worldwide uh, of our women veterans, of our women veteran community. Next slide, please. Some of our upcoming and ongoing events that we spoke about, we have our How That Women Veteran Survey. Um, it is due to close soon, and then there will be a report that is done, hopefully working in uh, late summer, that will be available to the public. It will be available through our Women Veterans newsletter or through our channel at Calvet. It will be distributed to service providers so that if you answered those questions, you amplified your voice, we collected the data, and we said, this is where she's at. This is what she needs. This is how she needs it. And then we go from there and build those outreach toolkits to educate service providers on the unique needs and the unique delivery preferences of women veterans. Um, we also will have a call out for the Calvet Trailblazer nomination. And we are hoping to plan um, a special ceremony for a Women Veterans Recognition Day. And with that will be the Women Veterans Reception where we hope to um, Announce the award winners for this 2024 Calvet Program Awards. Next slide, please. So um, please take the time here. This is the QR code. Um, if you are interested in taking our survey, this is the QR code that will lead you to um, provide your name and email. The way we delivered the survey was so that it was on a request basis. And that way, when you receive the survey link, you can take it at your own pace, um, in the comfort of your own home. It doesn't have to be on the go. And you if you need to pause um, during any particular topic or category, or just because you're doing 10 things at once and you time out, this gives you the opportunity to go right back in and pick up where you left off. And so this is a QR code that leads to an MS form requ uh, requesting your name, your email address, how you heard about the survey, what that does is I'm on the receiving end of that with my colleague, Ms. Pamela Plamondon, and we are the faces behind this form. We will get that form uh, loaded with a link that's appointed to you and send that out to the email that we get. Next up. The Women Veterans roster was established in 2013, and there have been uh, upwards of 18,500 women veterans that have joined. Um, as they leave the state, they send us a message, no longer in California, no problem. You remove them from the roster. We were set to relaunch our newsletter and get back on a monthly pace with our newsletter, but we do send out announcements and um, we call them the last if we have organizations that are doing special events, especially around like Mark was uh, Women's History Month and uh, June, Women Veterans Recognition Day, and any of those significant events, um, we do blast those out so that anywhere in California, if that event is near you, you have the opportunity to know about it, access to the information, and attend it, and meet your fellow assistants in the local areas. So if you would like to join, that's that what that QR code is for, and the website, or the link to it is also available there. Okay, thanks, bye.
and women voices. So we want to amplify our voices. We want to share our stories. That's the why. Why amplify the voice? As we just said, we want to make sure that we are recognized for the sacrifices and contributions. Um, we want to increase the more stories are out there that people are aware of, the more it will become normalized that yes, this is what a veteran looks like. And you don't have to be questioning me when I get out of my car in a hurry to run in and buy something. You know, we've heard those stories too many times. And I as, as recently as yesterday, so this is not a 10 years ago thing. And that's what I try to remind people because sometimes, you know, people will question it, but, but is it still the same? Yeah, yesterday, last week, these stories are coming at you live, but we have to share them because I believe that the more our brothers and our allies know that these things are still happening, they are our number one advocates that will come and step up for us as well and, and help us in moving forward with these um, with these campaigns to make sure that our stories are part of, you know, that first story is part of his story. Right, so that's what we want in the long run. Next slide. This is the application. If you do want to submit your story to CalVet and uh, be um, highlighted in our Women Voices campaign, and the QR code will lead you to this application as well. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, and. Uh, my name is Adriana Griffin. We have my information there. My colleague, Pamela Flamondon, is our analyst. And anytime you reach out to the Women Veterans um, email or through the website, we are the two that you're going to get responses from. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Adriana. Wow, what a powerhouse between Adriana and Lourdes. Um, the strength is amazing in those two strong women. And I love that they have such great loud voices and they advocate so well. So thank you so much, Adriana. Um, I love what you bring to the table. I am such a big fan of yours and I'm so grateful, uh, that you were able to present today and you are with CalVet. So thank you so much. All right, let's move on to our next slide which is um, the CalTAP portion of the presentation. Just going to go over um, CalVet resources and, and, and things like that. So just a little recap of where we are. The top there is the big Big VA, the federal, uh, the federal VA, Lourdes is part of the federal VA. The state right here, VA is called California Department of Veterans Affairs, CalVet. That is the department that I'm a part of, and so is Adriana. Um, and the next entity is the county offices. And then we have service providers uh, right there. When we, we wanted to show you this because we want you to understand that each one of these entities are separate. We don't work for each other, we work with each other to get resources and services to you at every single level. So what is CalTAP? CalTAP was designed to inform and connect veterans of all areas to their earned federal and state benefits um, and uh, provide continuing support and assistance as your needs change over time through five different pathways. We like to say that verbatim because we understand that your needs do change over time. The things that you need yesterday, you may not need today. The things that you need today, you may not need tomorrow or 10 years, 15 years, 30 years down the line. And we wanna be there for you cradle to grave and your family cradle to grave. And we do that um, with these different pathways, core curriculum, education, employment, entrepreneurship, and service providers. Now service providers is not a pathway for veterans or their families. It's actually for those that work with veterans and their families, kind of that culture competency pathway to give them the tools um, and the resources that uh, educate them on your needs. This is what I mean when I mean cradle to grave. I mean, we wanna support you before you even join the military. We wanna help you prep for the military. What questions do you ask the recruiter? What kind of things, where do you go to study for the ASFAB? Um, all that great information before you even begin. And then we wanna support you 
when you, while you're in, while you're serving, while you're transitioning out, when you're out, um, when you retire, as you age, um, and then, and then as you pass on, we want to continue to support you by supporting your family members. So cradle grave, this is a picture of what we mean by that. Here's the Veterans Resource Book, the California Department of Veterans Affairs Resource Book. It is fantastic. It is a wealth of information. It is like gold, everybody. You don't know what you don't know. And this book has federal and state benefits inside of it. Um, and what you can do is look through this book, um, learn about those different benefits, and then find some, uh, then reach out to CalVet, reach out to the federal VA and ask them, hey, I learned about this benefit. Am I eligible? Can you help me apply for this? It's a very great resource for you. The next resource is our website. It is fantastic. It is extremely user-friendly. Do not be afraid of rabbit holes in this website because rabbit holes lead to carrots. Carrots is benefits. Benefits is money in your pocket and your family's pocket. If your kids are getting ready to go to school or even in school right now, you can find out about all the different benefits to save you money um, or provide money for school, education, for yourself, for your kids, for your spouses. Um, I have circled here three different things. CalTAP, that is where you're going to find all those different pathways I was telling you about. And then in the middle, the middle circle there is find local CVSO. It stands for County Veteran Service Office. So if there's a benefit or if you want to submit a claim or whatever it may be, these guys are accredited by CalVet to do claims and also accredited to uh, do the CalVet fee waiver and lots of other different things that they're accredited to do to assist you. They're absolutely free. If you click on that link and you look up your county, there is going to be a list of the different offices, the phone numbers, addresses, and times that they're open. Um, the last thing there is the resource book. You can download that resource book anytime through our website. So please do that and share that book with as many people as possible. All right, and this is uh, some information about our local interagency network coordinators. We call them links. Links are gonna link you up to the different resources in your local areas. There's eight different CalVet representatives that live in your areas that make relationships with the different organizations, the different VAs, uh, facilities, um, and anybody that can actually assist you with any type of difficulties or obstacles you might have in your area. As you can see, um, there is uh, ones all the way down in Southern California and San Diego. We have them all the way up at the top on the border of Oregon. So we're all over the place. There's emails here, but you can definitely give me a call um, or you can give us a call and we can set you up with your link in your area if you need assistance. So again, they provide outreach and, to service members, veterans, and the families. They make referrals that to work directly with service providers in that area. They assist in local emergencies. Maybe there's a fire in your area. Maybe you lost your home. They can assist with getting your DD Form 214. They can assist with um, getting you housing assistance. A lot of different things. Maybe you're part of a flood and um, you, you know you need help with debris. They can help you with that. And they also provide leadership and advocacy in those local communities also. They're the ones that are speaking up and, and saying, these are the needs of the veterans in your communities. How can we help the veterans and in, in the families in the communities? Here's my information. I went through it very, uh, the CalTAP overview very quickly because we're getting close to the hour mark. Um, please give me a call, send me an email, uh, do any of the above. Call that 800 number. That 800 number goes to eight different um, uh, CalTAP training coordinators, also goes to our links. Um, we do answer those phone calls, so please give us a call. Um, and the last number at the bottom I want to bring to everyone's attention is the crisis line. It used to be a very long, cumbersome number to remember, but now it is very easy. It is 988. I hope it becomes as synonymous and as uh, as uh, easy to remember as 911. If you or somebody you know, or you even meet somebody on the street that's in crisis, you know to call 988. This number 988 is not just for veterans or their families, it's for anybody that's in crisis at at all. If you press one, that is the crisis line for veterans. So 988, you can text it, you can call it, press 
on for veterans. All right, with that, um, oh, and just lastly here, we're gonna talk about, we wanna to continue to support you. So send your non-DOD email address to caltap at calvet.ca.gov. We can send you a newsletter with all the update, um, up, up and coming benefits of, that are opening up to you, different news that applies to um, you and things like that. It's really great stuff. Or you can also find out about our upcoming webinars also there. Find us on social media, especially that YouTube channel that has hundreds of great um recordings of all the different workshops that we've done over the last four years on anything and everything you can think of. If there's something that's not on there, let us know. We will get the subject matter experts and we will do a workshop on that. Attend webinars and fill out today's survey. All right, here is your opportunity to advocate and to be a part of change that improves um, our programs. So please fill out our survey. Let us know how we did. Let us know if we did something really great. Let us know if there's something we could change. Let us know if there's something else we can do. Fill out, we're going to give you one minute here to get your phones out um, and point it at the screen and click on the link that brings you to the survey to let us know how we did. All right. So while you guys are doing that, we're going to start looking at the Q and A's. Um, I know that we did have one question come in and that question was, can we have a PDF of these slides? And we, we can definitely do that for you. Um, all you need to do is send your send an email to caltap at calvet.ca.gov and send us an email and say you would like the slides for this uh, this workshop and we'll send those over to you. Additionally, as a reminder, this is being recorded so it's gonna be available online too. Um, so we can um, just check on our YouTube channel so you can also watch this webinar again or, or even share it with other people. All right, so with that, I'm going to hand the floor over to Jana, who is on our back end. Jana, did we have any other questions come in? You know, we didn't have any other ones come in that I can see. Okay. All right. Well, here is all of our contact information. If you want, get your phones out, everybody, and you can take a picture of this screen right here. But again, if you would like to get a copy of the slides, please send, your, send an email to... Um, myself, Jana, or caltap at calvet.ca.gov. It's right there at the top um, under California Department of Veterans Affairs. We have it, the last uh, little email there in the middle. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it says caltap at calvet.ca.gov. So you can send an email to that requesting this slides. Um, and that concludes our presentation for today. We want to say thank you all for your service. Thank you for being here. Please share, please advocate, um, and have a fantastic day. Thank you so much to Adriana, and thank you so much to Lourdes. Thank you to all of our partners. Um, we truly appreciate what you do on a day-to-day -day basis to advocate and outreach um, and to support um, all of our veterans in the state of California and all over the United States and the world. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.